Well, I can guarantee you don't want us to all sing. Um, you should have heard me in the shower this morning. I, uh, I was doing all four parts. Uh, you know, it took three of them to do what I did. It's, uh, well, it is good to be back here um, in Exeter. Um, I, uh, I, w- I, was, I was torn this week. I had a message that God laid in my heart early in the week, and uh, I started uh, to prepare it, and then God pulled me away from it. And it wasn't until just the last uh, 24 hours that he pulled me back to the original message. So uh, I'm going to be speaking on evangelism today. And uh, that was going to be the general topic, but I, I'm, I'm specifically going to look at evangelizing children uh, because that's what God has laid on my heart um, I'm going to start with the story, though. It's a bit of a somber story, um, but there is a message that's to come out of it. An experienced firefighter was recently charged with grave neglect of duty. Prosecutors maintained that he abandoned his responsibility when he failed to release uh, rescue equipment. This resulted in the needless and tragic death of a family of five. Eyewitnesses were sickened when they discovered that the reason the firefighter remained locked in the emergency vehicle was simply because he was testing a new piece of high-tech audio equipment which he maintained he purchased as a gift for the fire chief. The fire chief immediately distanced himself from the defendant and he dishonorably discharged him from the department. In a prepared statement, the chief said, there are no words to describe such a betrayal of those he was sworn to protect. The lead prosecuting attorney argued that for more than three minutes after arriving on the scene, the firefighter wore earphones and listened to the audio equipment while a family of five was screaming to be rescued from the sixth floor of a burning building. Horrified onlookers relayed that as the flames licked her clothing, a mother cried out in terror and fell to her death while clutching an infant in her arms. Other witnesses said that a father was clutching two terrified children as he was engulfed by massive flames. This terrifying drama took place in full view of the firefighter as he remained seated in the vehicle, listening to the audio device. The defense pleaded no contest, but added that the defendant went to great personal sacrifice to purchase the expensive gift for the chief, and he hoped that the judge would take that into consideration. What do you think a fitting punishment is for this serious crime? Two years in jails, 20 years, life imprisonment, capital punishment? It's a tough question. Um, This morning, I'm a bit of a joke. In my family, I have six points I want to look at, and there's always a bit of a debate of how many points I'm going to get through. But because you were so gracious with the time, I may just be able to do that and maybe uh, prove my daughter's wrong. But you know, it was a heavy story. And many of you may be asking what this story has to do with the message today. And before I answer that question, I want to ask a question to follow up on this. There we go. So the question I want to ask is, do you find it easy to love and worship God? I think we do. And I think when we think about how beautiful God is, how wonderful he is, how immense the love he expressed towards us dying on the cross, it's easy to worship God, isn't it? I think it is. I mean, even today, just listening to the, you know, the prayers and the songs of praise to him, it, it's easy for us to love him. But sometimes it's not as easy for us to demonstrate that love by obeying his commandments. That's a bit what we're going to talk about today. We are at risk of doing just what that firefighter did. In the story, the firefighter was so busy trying to please the chief that he failed to do what the chief had called him to do. The firefighter had been trained how to rescue people. He'd been trained how to deploy the ladders, how to get the hoses out to to do the the high incline rescues. He was trained with that, but he didn't do it. He sat in the fire truck. He failed to do what he was called to do. So the question is, how are we doing as individuals? How are we doing as the local body believers in deploying our, our tools? Are we too busy? trying to please God with our gifts, our songs, our praise, our worship service? Are we too busy preparing gifts for the chief and we're not doing what he asked us to do? And that's what we're going to talk about a little bit today. So we're going to be talking about evangelism. In particular, we're going to be looking at evangelism of children. And children are a special place in my heart. We're going to be looking at six, or trying to look at six reasons why we need to evangelize children. 
why we need to share the gospel to children in our families, in this church, in this community, um, why we need to do it. So you can start with the first point. The first point is God's message is for everyone. God commanded the disciples to preach the gospel to every creature. And we read this in Mark 15. He said, and he said to them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. The word up there, go, is, is a command. It's a verb. It's an action. It means for us to actually get out, depart, do something. So where are we to go? It says we're to go, but where are we to go? We're told to go into all the world and to preach the gospel to every creature. I don't want anyone to think they're off the hook when because in the King James it uses the word preach. Other translations, and if you look them up, it actually says to proclaim the good news. So we may not all be all preachers. I'm not a preacher, but I'm certainly here to encourage you that we can proclaim the good news. We are proclaim the good news to the every creature, all of creation. Second point in this is God's love extends to every individual in the world. And we know this from John 3.16. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You know, Mark 16.15 tells us we're to go into the world, but this verse tells us that we're to love, and God loves every individual in the world. The Greek word used here in love is, it's a verb, apageo, which is derived from the Greek word agape. Agape love, that unconditional love. So why is God's message for everyone? Because God has chosen each person with a discriminating affection. And we've been called to share that truth. We're told to go into the world and share God's unconditional love for every individual in the world. God's message is for everyone. God's love extends to every individual. Third point in this one. God, the promise of salvation was not given with age limits. And I want to look at this, and we can look again at John 3.16, the word whosoever there. The whosoever is a word that actually amplifies the word believeth, right? So whosoever believeth, it's saying all people. If you look at the Greek, it says each and everyone, all the parts of the whole, all the parts of the whole world can believeth in him and can have everlasting life. There are no age restrictions on the whosoever. That simply means whosoever believeth. Take it one step further. We look at Matthew, or John 1, uh, 12. As many as received him, to them gave he power to become sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And again, the phrase here, as many as receive him, often tra translated as all who did receive him, affirms to us that God is saying that all can come to saving faith in Christ. It's a matter of belief. All those that believe on his name. One more passage from 10.13, sorry, Romans 10.13, again, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the uh, Lord shall be praised. That same word, whosoever, is the same word we used in John 3.16. And that's the first point, that God's message is for everyone. And that's where we're going to start, but we're going to move now Every person, every person relates, uh, regardless of age. The message is for the lost, regardless of age, and that leads us to point number two that we're going to look at. Children are lost. I don't think my children know what's in this, uh, in this slide here, but uh, some of you know that I have twins. Um, I have a picture of them shortly after they were born. Um, those are my twins. That's uh, Josiah on the right and Maya on the left. Aren't they cute? <laughs> Innocent. Perfect little children, aren't they? Or are they? Are they? No, they don't stay that way, do they? Um, but we still love them just the same. I mean, they grow up and they become people like me, and we're filled with faults. I was reading a, an article, a blog, and I, I saw a headline of a blog, Christian blog article, and this was the headline. I want, I want you to read it with me, and they're going to ask you if this is something we should, we should teach. So here's the tale. Should children be taught that they're dirty, rotten sinners? What do you think? Yes? No? I mean, it's true. We are dirty, rotten sinners. We are, are sin at the core. I don't think we need to use those words, though. I mean, the reality is we have a problem, they have a problem that's in us, and that's sin. And that sin can only be fixed by Jesus and what he did on the cross. So inherently, uh, we're lost. We're all lost, and we're born like, like that. 
Um, children have a sinful nature, and that's the message of this. The Bible is quite clear on this. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That all is all-encompassing. All of us have sin in us. And that's pretty clear. Go to, uh, what's the next one? Romans 10, 13. Again, Paul, talking to the church in Rome, uses the same word. The word all in Greek is the same word as the whosoever in Greek. It's the exact same word. So Paul says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So it's saying all are sinful and all can be saved, even children who are lost. We know and understand that we've all sinned. Every one of us, regardless of age, we all have a sinful nature but likewise, we all have the opportunity to call on the name of the Lord. One more verse from Romans 5, 17. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. And this is the reality. Spiritual death came by one man, Adam, and spiritual life or redemption comes through Christ and what he did on the cross. Psalm 31, David knew this all so well. From the veriest little, in Psalm 51, 5, he says, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Children have a sinful nature. We all have a sinful nature that cannot be resolved apart from the work on the cross. Next point. Children need to be aware of their condition before God. We're not going to use their dirty, rotten sinners, but we are going to teach them that we all have this. The Bible commands us that we need to evangelize everyone. Uh, Mark 16, 15, we read it earlier, it says, And he said to them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. This means we're required to evangelize all, including children, in a thorough biblical way. We need to teach them God's message from God's word. Our job is to proclaim the gospel and leave the question of regeneration to God. Regeneration is simply a fancy word for being born from above, born again. Um, regenerated, made anew, uh, we get the word born again, that biblical phrase from it. There's God's part and there's our part. Our part is to share the gospel. We need to have a sure understanding of our part and God's part in evangelism. Our part is proclamation, to proclaim the good news. God's part is to do the saving. After regeneration or being born again or being born from above, we begin to see and hear spiritual things. We need to see changes in the lives of children. We, need, we see changes in the lives of adults. We begin to live a life, life of faith and holiness. We're partakers of the divine nature. We have been made new creatures. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. If any child is in Christ, he is a new creature. Um, David Livingstone, a famous Scottish missionary and explorer, said this, our business is to teach children about sin and the Savior. Without even a hint about a certain age to accept Christ, the Holy Spirit will, in due time, convict them of sin. When he convicts of sin, whatever the age, who are we to dare to interfere with his work? It is at this, of all times, that we should show our sympathetic interest. Any child is old enough to accept Christ when he realizes that his sin is against God and that because of that, he is lost without Christ. Powerful, powerful quote from David Livingston. In section one, we looked at God's messages for everyone. In this section, we looked at children are lost. Now we're going to explore what scripture commands us through his word. So scripture commands us. Go ahead and turn with me to Matthew chapter 18. Um, we're going to look at the first 14 verses, and that is going to be kind of the basis of this next section this is going to be the part that determines whether I get through one, three points or six. So um, to start, I'd like to, um, actually, I'm, I'm going to read the passage as we go, so I'm not going to read it in its entirety. I, I'm going to start with one more quote. Um, it's from a man by the name of Robert Stuart MacArthur. Uh, he's a pastor, Canadian-born, American preacher, uh, New York City, uh, end of the 18th century, beginning of the 19th century uh, in New York City at Calvary Baptist Church. He pastored there for over 40 years. Here, here's a quote. I don't know if anyone knows the name, but uh, Robert Stuart MacArthur, 1903, he said this, it is painful to think how often we neglect the children then labor with the agonizing prayer and heroic appeal for the conversion of men and women. 
uh, Dave uh, shared with me before the service that, you know, uh, I forget the exact quote, but it's easier for uh, a soft reed to bend than a tree to bend, right? And we need to reach out to these, these children. This quote was taken from, it, the, art, the title of the article was interesting. It says, Evangelism in the City Family Church by Robert Stuart MacArthur, 1903. They had the same issues we have today, some 120-ish years later. We're discussing the same topic. How do we, what does scripture say to us about reaching out to these lost children? A couple points on this one. Number one, the, you know, the age to be evangelized is debated. And I think we could go around the room here and ask people when they came to saving knowledge of Christ, and we get very, very different, different ages. But sometimes this age is often debated. But you know, Christ begins this section in Matthew 18 talking a little bit about children, um, and we're going to go there. So Matthew 18, 2, the verse um, that I'm pulling up, it says, And Jesus called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them. I don't want to inundate you with Greek in this, but the little children, child, are used with different words. And the particular words that they're using in this verse is paideon, which means little children under seven. And by definition, this typically refers to a little child under seven. It's the same word that is used in Mark 9, 36 and 37. When he said, and he took a little child and set him in the midst of them. And when he had taken him up into his arms, he said to them, whosoever shall receive one such child in my name receiveth me. And whosoever shall receive me receiveth not me, but him that sent me. If my kids' children were still here, I would have asked Maya. She's one of the twins, seven years old, to come up. And I'm not sure if you saw her, but she's standing about this big now. And just picture Jesus picking up a paideon, a little child of seven years, and putting him in his arms and saying, this is the age of the little child that can believe with faith. Seven years old. And younger. Number two point on this. The requirement to enter as little children. This is a message for us as adults. Adults are required to enter the kingdom as little children depending humbly on God. Looking at uh, verses 3 and 4 in chapter 18, it says, and he said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, Pideon, under seven, ye shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Again, telling us to be like that child of seven years old. It's an amazing promise. Requirements. We're not supposed to act like those seven-year-olds, those little children, but we're supposed to return to child attitudes, not actions. Children live in a natural environment of dependence. We need to depend on our Savior. So many times we've heard that people say we want to raise our children to be independent people. We don't. We want them to raise them as to being dependent on God alone in all things. Independence separates us from God. Dependence cleaves us to him. Third point here. Somewhere. Third point here. Lord's great value on the little child. So in verse 5, it goes on to say how valuable these little children are. It says, And whoso shall receive one such little child in my name receiveth me. This is an amazing promise. Receiving. Receive here means to welcome. If we receive these little children, it's just like we're welcoming Jesus himself. Who shall receive one of them? Who gather them into his arms is like receiving or gathering Jesus in our arms as well. And that's an amazing promise. If we receive a child, it's like receiving my name, receiving me. Or receiving them in my name, it's like receiving me. Uh, one more quote from Charles Spurgeon. He said this. He said this about learning what we can do and what we can learn from receiving children. Those who receive little ones in Christ's name will grow or become like them. And in this way, receive Christ into their own souls, becoming more like him. That's a powerful promise, too. Where verse 5 talked about the positive effects of receiving the little children, verse 6 serves as a warning to those that offend these little ones. 
Verse 6 says this, But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depths of the sea. Receiving them comes blessing. Offending them has consequences. The word offend here means to put a snare in the way of, to cause to stumble, to give offense. Offending one of these little ones that believe in me has severe consequences. So what does believe in me mean? Well, verse 6, we'll look at that. Believe in me. The word here, pastuio, belief is defined as a saving faith. And in definition, this definition of saving faith is affirmed by Jesus himself. The same expression, believe in me, are the same words that are used in John 3.16 and in Acts, so John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth, that's that saving faith. So again, relating back to the children can have that same saving faith. And then Acts 16, it goes on, another example says, And they say, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. That believe is that saving faith that those little children can have. Saving faith. Just a note here, it's interesting. The word for little children in Greek has changed in this verse. And it changes the context of this verse as well. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones, it's no longer that paideon, but it's a new world called micros. That looks like an English word we use, right? Microbial, very small. It's like comparing the least of to the greatest. Least and greatest, and that's the context here. This would, word not only refers to the physical age and size, but also to the importance and status of the children. These children have great importance or status in the eyes of God. The Lord places great value on the least of these. Fourth point in this section, there's a warning about regarding children lightly. What are our attitudes towards the children that we serve? What are the attitudes toward our children's ministry? It's going to get political, but I'm not going to go there. I will for a minute. Okay. You know, look at some of these large churches, and I have done that. I've looked at financial statements a number of times, and we hear that children are important. It's important to reach out to the children. Sometimes you look at these three, four, five hundred thousand dollars budgets, and you go down to the children's ministry, and you see a ministry budget that's somewhere up there with the coffee budget. What does that say about how important these children are? I don't think you guys have a four or five hundred thousand dollar budget here, but so I hope I'm not stepping on any toes. I don't see anyone picking their feet up off their ground. But in verse ten, we read this. He says, "Take heed that ye despise not one of these little ones." For I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. You don't want to despise these children. They have angels assigned to them watching over them. Despise means to view down with a negative or hostile outlook, thinking little of, esteemingly lightly, seeing as insignificant or detestable, to treat with contempt or disregard. Children are important to God. We were at a conference in um, Nashville, Tennessee. This conference, it's a family conference, was bordering the facilities of a, of a mega church down there. And on the door, on the way into the sanctuary, it said, children under six not permitted. Can you believe that? Number five, one child is important. Looking at verse 12. 12. How think ye, if a man have a hundred sheep and one of them be gone astray, doth he not leave the ninety and nine and goeth into the mountain and seeketh that which has gone astray? God is going to search after the lost. And not only is he going to search after the lost, in verse 13 it says, And if so be that he find it, verily I say unto you, he rejoices more of that sheep than of the ninety and nine which went not astray. God's desire is that not one of these little ones should perish, verse 14. Even so, it is not the will of your Father which is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. The word perish here, it's actually a fairly violent word. Completely perish implies permanent, absolute destruction to cancel out, to remove. God said he doesn't want one of these children to be obliterated from his kingdom to be separated from him permanently. Our children are under attack, and many are perishing. I'm getting to point four. Children are under attack. 
Children, I'm going to maybe quickly go through this when there's a lot of points here, but children are under attack from every direction. Our children are under spiritual attack, that's a given. But they're under, also under attack from this world. The world is throwing all kinds of thoughts and ideas about them. The world is a snare to them. The world is causing them to stumble. We as a church, we as parents and fathers, and as a family of, of church, we need to dismantle these roadblocks and keep them from not hearing the word of God. I have all kinds of stats on the media and the impact of media, and I'm not going to go through there, but television, movies, music videos, video games, all of them are throwing, are discipling all our children, discipling our children, throwing all kinds of wrong ideas at them, and we need to intervene. We need to stop them. Television studies confirm that there's a significant relationship between watching violent television and increasing violent behavior by children. It's proven to encourage unhealthy or unnatural sexual behaviors throughout all age groups. The average child watches 14 hours of television each week. And the stat I pulled out, now keep in mind there's weekends and summer breaks and holidays, but it says, by the time a student graduates high school, they would have spent more time watching television than the time they spent in the classroom. What are they learning in the classroom to begin with? Look at how many hours of Christian education they're sitting on. It doesn't even show up on the radar. They're being discipled by the media. I've got all kinds of stats in violence. I'm not going to go there, but... You know, if you grew up in the 80s, you know the movies like uh, Terminator and Die Hard. Unless you're good Christians like me and didn't watch those movies. No, I'm kidding. I watched them. They were rated R back then. Rated R. If they were rated under today's system, PG-13. What does that say about where we're going on our slide? It's unbelievable. Because of that, movies like today, such as Hunger Games and Avengers, currently rated PG-13, would have been rated R back then. Next point. Children can be born again. This is truth. Some people are skeptical and find it difficult to believe in the reality of child conversion. However, there's no verse in the Bible that says a child cannot come into personal relationship with God through faith in Christ Jesus. A couple points here. Children are more ready to receive the Savior. Children have open, ready hearts. Children are naturally humble, teachable, trusting. Their hearts and minds are ready to be filled. Children are teachable and trusting. You know, we can't let the world fill up their minds and thoughts with garbage. We need to fill them up. Um, Mr. Martin shared in our first service exactly what's on here. What are we to fill up our kids' minds with? Well, it tells us. In Ephesians, the Philippians 4, it says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good rapport, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Third point, tomorrow, young, impressionable hearts may be hardened. What causes hearts to be hardened? Well, we know the answer to that. We know the answer is sin. Sin causes hardness on our hearts. If we allow the children's sin to build up and build up and build up, we become calloused and hard, inflexible. So how do we deal with sin? We know how we deal with sin. It's through repentance and forgiveness. We need to put that sin on the cross. How can we do that? Introducing them to their Lord and Savior, telling them that he can take the sin out of their lives. John 1.19 assures us of this, and it's just a, a quick vote here. Um, if we confess with our, our sins, if we confess our sins, Jesus is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. That's a promise. He will take care. However, we don't confess our sins. They have a cumulative and desensitizing effect on the conscience, making it difficult to distinguish right from wrong. Children need to be drawn to Christ, need to be drawn to him through his word. Children can believe. Children can trust. Another uh, quote from Spurgeon about children. Says a child of five, if properly instructed, can as truly believe and be re regenerated as an adult. My conviction is that our converts from among children are among the best that we have. I should judge them to have been more numerously genuine than any other class, more constant, and in the long run, more solid. Spurgeon, Prince of Preachers, how many years ago? How many 
centuries ago did he, did he share those words. One more quote from Stephen Olford. Stephen Olford um, was a Christian leader, very influential in the lives of men like Billy Graham, uh, Charles Stanley, Adrian Rogers. He was kind of a confidant, and, and here's what he said. Oh, here's what he said. Here's what he said. I believe in child evangelism for three reasons. First, because I was born again when I was only seven. That's good, pretty good proof. Second, because the history of general evangelism shows that by far the greatest portion of conversions take place before the age of 20. It's a fact, even today. And third, because the Bible makes it plain that youth is the time to return to God. And he quotes Ecclesiastes um, 12, which says, Remember also your creator in the days of your youth, before the evil days come and now, as come and the years draw near, which you will say, I have no pleasure in them. Third point, C, children are dependent on us to show them the way. In his book, Come Ye Children by Charles Spurgeon, here's another quote from him. I'm sorry I've thrown all kinds of quotes, but you know, there are greater men that have gone before me and have discerned these, and this is just something that spoke to me. It says, very, very, very confidently, do I leave this work in the hands of teachers. I never knew a nobler body of Christian men and women. Those who teach children is what he's talking about. Be encouraged. The God who saves so many of your children is going to save very many more of them. And we shall have great joy as we see hundreds brought to Christ. The call to teach children is very esteemed. It's something that is important and God will bless you for it. And we need to have the same passion that Spurgeon is talking about in this. Last point. Children are our nation's future. Children are lost, plain and simply. If we don't acknowledge the fact that children are lost, and if they stay lost, they will never be the future of this nation. It's that simple. We need to raise the alarm. They're in danger. They need to be rescued. And if we don't, there's consequences. God warns that if children... Uh, that if children are not taught, future generations will cease to follow his world. We know that from, from even Deuteronomy 6. That there's a, a command to the nation of Israel. Teach your children. You're going into a foreign land. There's going to be foreign gods all around you. Teach them as you walk, when you, uh, by the way, when you rise up, when you lay down. Our, we were commanded to teach. The nation of Israel didn't teach their children, and look what happened to them. We're not teaching our children, and look at what's happening to us. Judges, Judges 2 talks about this as well. And all that generation also were gathered to their fathers. And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. Forgotten. Forgotten all the blessings of the past. And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. If we do not reach the children with the truth of God's word, what will the next generation look like? Southern Baptist Conference reportedly has 16 million people, and it suggests that they're dropping by 25% each generation. Next generation is going to be 1.2 million. Next generation, 900,000. They may be evangelizing a lot of new converts, but what's going out the back door? The only answer is a concentrated effort to reach the children. Billy Sunday, renowned evangelist, said this, the only way on God's earth you will solve the problem of reaching the masses is by getting hold of the children. Last point here. Win a child for Christ, you have saved an entire life. If you win an adult, you've only saved a soul. It sounds a little crass, but you know what? Children have their whole life to invest into the kingdom. Uh, some of you know I was a financial planner for 25 years, and I, I, I've seen a correlation between the, 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 one of the famous principles of investing and the, the principles investing in the life of children. And I'm going to share with you, it's a little tip, it's free, no extra charge for this today. It's one, of, it's one of the most powerful tools in investing. Isn't that powerful? Woo! Anybody know what that is? All right, you smarty pants. It is, a, is it on there somewhere? Yeah, it is. It is the calculation for compounding. You know what the greatest one factor in that formula is? 
That little T there, you know what T stands for? Time. Time. When a child is saved as a young child, they have an entire lifetime to invest in the kingdom. Their investment is compounded by the years that they have to proclaim the gospel. Isn't that awesome? Time. I lied. There's one more point. Now is the time to reach children. 2 Corinthians uh, 2, 6, 2, Paul exhorts us. In a favorable time, I listened to you. And in the day of salvation, I have helped you. Behold, now is the time, a favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Someone asked once, when is the best time to treat and plant an oak tree? Anybody know the answer? 50 years ago. When's the next best time? Today. Today is the day of salvation. We need to raise up a forest of oak trees in our children. The last 30 minutes or so, we've looked over a number of topics. I got all six done. God's messages for everyone. Children are lost. Scripture commands us. Children are under attack. Children can be born again. And children are the future of our nation. God's word says that children need the Lord. Remember that story at the beginning? Firefighter? And a family of five that perished in the fire because the firefighter failed to deploy the tools that he was given, the resources that he had, the training that he had. Perhaps there's a family of five in this church. Perhaps there's a family of five on your street or in this community or in your workplace. And they're about to be engulfed by the massive flames of eternity. That's a reality. We've been trained, we've been called, and now we need to get out of the fire truck or out of the church or off the pew and do what God commanded us to do. We need to extend the tools and extend that rescue letter, the gospel of Jesus Christ, to those around us. May the love of God constrain each of us to go, to reach, to share with those around us. I have a minute. Uh, I have a benediction, but uh, I said if I had five minutes, I'm going to ask my daughter to come, and she's going to play a, um, a hymn. Um, if you want to follow along, it's number 299 in your red hymn books. It's Rescue the Perishing, and I thought it was an appropriate one that we could just follow along with as she uh, plays four verses, and then I'll close with a benediction. <laughs> her uh, as she walked in the, the room of the, the church today to do that, so she's a pretty good bluffer like her dad. For the benediction, I'm going to be reading from Jude, chapter 17 to the end. But beloved, remember the words which were spoken before the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you there should be uh, mockers in the last time, who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. These be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the spirit. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on the most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And some have compassion making a difference. 
and others saving with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by flesh. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. God bless you, church.